Thank you, Akira, for the presentation. Um, so first of all, um, in behalf of, of Paula, I would like to, to, to say that she, she, she's, not, she's not able to be here, but she's sorry, and she asked me actually last night to give this presentation, so uh, let's hope that everything goes fine. <laughs> um, so she was planning to give a presentation about like a toolbox for quantum thermodynamics, uh, in the group, uh, quantum engineering group at MIT, we have both NV centers in diamond uh, as single systems or as an ensemble. And we also have some uh, NMR systems, solid state NMR. So I guess she was trying to give some like uh, very broad view of, of, of these experimental platforms. Um, but I'm only an expert in uh, single NV centers in diamond. So I will give a less broad uh, perspective of this experimental platform, uh, but I hope that you find it uh, interesting. The, the, the main idea of the presentation is just to show you what we can do with this, with this system, with the systems, what, what, is, what are the limitations, and hopefully maybe someone will find some interest uh, in, in this platform and we can discuss later. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, as Akira was saying, I'm, I'm a postdoc at Paula Cabrera Group. Uh, the work that I'm presenting today was mainly do, uh, uh, mainly did, I did this when I was uh, in Florence. Uh, I was working with Nicole Fabri, uh, Francesco Poggiali, Stefano Gallardini, and Francesco Capagliotti. And uh, many of these results are uh, due to the collaboration with Alessio, Amica, Matteo, Andrea, and Michele. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I obviously. I have to thank all of them because without them it will not be possible. Um, so okay, let's let's get to it. I guess I can use my mouse as a pointer to also take into consideration the people from I'm, I'm not sure if they can see. Okay, anyway. So um okay, so MV centers in diamonds. So this is a, 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 um, a point like defect in a diamond lattice. Uh, these are mainly used for quantum sensing because they have very good properties. And, uh, and these are spin-based systems, so they are coupled to external magnetic fields. So basically, they have a lot of lots of applications on, on magnetometry, including, for example, some optimal control algorithms or, or similar. Um, since these diamonds are biocompatible, they are also quite popular for biosensing. And since the diamond itself has other impurities inside it, it can, that can be used uh, as, a, as a quantum register. This uh, platform can also be used for some quantum information. And of course, uh, recently they have been used for quantum thermodynamics. Um, so this is obviously what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, so the outline of, of the presentation will be the following. So um, I know that maybe all of you are familiar with NV centers, so I will spend a couple of minutes presenting what, what these are. Uh, and then I will basically divide the talk into two main topics. One is about the reconstruction of energy variation during probabilities, so the two-point two measurement scheme or two-time measurement. With this, we can reconstruct some fluctuational relations, mainly focused on, on the NV center as an open quantum, quantum system. And we, with this, we can also uh, Real, we were able to realize some Maxwell Leon, which is yeah. interesting. Um, and then at the very end, uh, yeah, if I have time, I will show you one of the latest results, which is uh, related to going beyond the TPM scheme. So uh, when you were, uh, basically this is related to quasi probabilities associated to the, to the energy variable, uh, specifically keep to do that quasi probability. Okay, so let's start with the introduction to NV centers. So as I told you, these are point like defects in a diamond lattice where instead of a, instead of two carbons, you have a nitrogen and a, vac a vacancy next to it. And this system basically is formed by six electrons, which can also be understood as two holes, basically. And this means that it, they, they can generate uh, spin triplets or spin singlets. And in this particular system has an orbital ground state, which is a spin triplet, okay? Uh, the separation between this spin triplet is not degenerate, 
first because the uh, zero cube splitting separates the plus minus one from zero. And also we always put a, magnet, a bias magnetic field aligned with the quantitation axis of the system uh, to basically separate plus minus one. So we have really a, a three level system that we can uh, manipulate with uh, microwave uh, radiation. Uh, you can see here a picture of, of the diamond. If you were thinking of these shiny ring like diamonds, you will get disappointed. This is basically, it looks like a piece of glass, a one millimeter by one millimeter piece of glass. Um, and this is uh, an antenna that uh, basically a small wire that delivered the microwave. And we put also uh, this uh, on top of an objective. The objective is relevant because we need to use green light uh, to both initialize the system, but also read out its state. Um, I don't want to go into too much details about all these uh, op uh, optical properties, but mainly you can say that upon uh, long illumination, the system goes into some uh, different orbital excited states and singlet states. And in the case, and the most probable decay is to go to M is equal to zero. So we can really initialize the system there with very high fidelity above, above, above 96%. Um, and also the intensity of the red light emitted by the sensor. Uh, sorry, I, I use the word sensor because I work with quantum sensing there, but the defect, the, the, the red light emitted by the defect is also recollected with this, with this objective. And the intensity is different depending on the initial state of your system. So we can optically initialize the system, but also optically read out its state. Um, and yeah, okay, so the separation of this uh, ground state is of the order of gigahertz, so we can drive it with microwave radiation. And it has a long coherence time, even at room temperature, it has a coherence time of the order of one millisecond, which doesn't sound like too much, but you need to consider that these gates, for example, applying a pipe pulse here, takes like 50 nanoseconds or something. So in one millisecond, we have more than enough time to, to apply a, a lot of control gates. Uh, and of course, the system can go to cryogenic temperature, but in, in our experiments, we only use room temperature ones. Um, so, and one other very, and this is probably the most uh, important slide of my presentation. So, one thing that is very interesting about any centers is it's in, in the environment. Of, uh, so, in general, there can be uh, other defects in the diamond lattice, in, in depending on how what kind of sample you have. Uh, but it, like, the most common one is to have a lot of carbon-13 impurities, which are, uh, 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 they have a, a nuclear spin, which is one half, and they act collectively uh, to actually induce some decoherence into our electronic spin. So this obviously, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, our electronic spin is coupled to, the, to, the, to all these nuclear spins, and collectively they act as, uh, as a spin bath, uh, that can be modeled as a stochastic field uh, with, with some uh, distribution central, uh, with a, some distribution with a peak at the Larmor frequency of the nuclear spins. And usually we don't really want this because this is the coherence, so there are ways to filter this out. But I think that this is actually an interesting environment that has been studied from the point of view of quantum thermodynamics. There are some groups going uh, that are planning to, I know that uh, in Torino, I think in the north of Italy, there are some groups working on trying to use this environment, but not at room temperature, but at uh, cryogenic temperature. So actually have a, 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 a real cool bath, cold bath to, to study equations and so on. Uh, but yeah, this, this could be one of the interesting aspects. Another interesting aspect is that in some cases, you can have some nuclear spin that is actually so close to the electronic spin that you can distinguish it from the spin bath. And this means that you can see some coherent coupling between, between them. And this is very useful because then you can, so some groups use this as a quantum register, for example, because the, the coherent time of the nuclear spin is a bit much, large, much longer. Um, but uh, in our case, what we're interested in is using this as an ancillary system, which can be implemented for some interferometric schemes, for example. Uh, and the other uh, kind of environment that I want to tell you about today is the presence of 
the laser itself. So I told you that the laser is used to initialize the system and read out. But it turns out that if you use very, very short lasers, you can think about these as, as some sort of kick to the, to the system, so some small perturbation. And this is a perturbation that has some dissipative properties because eventually the system will be initialized in the MSC zero state. But in a single interaction, it's, it's just a, a small perturbation. And basically, this is what we have been, this is like, yeah, what we have been working on in the last couple of years. Mm, either uh, the, the Hamiltonian here is determined by the, obviously, the, the, the Hamiltonian of the system, but also the microwave that we use to drive, to drive it. Um, so we have a, quite a good control on what the Hamiltonian can be. And uh, yeah, so basically we have been doing experiments either with a three-level system or a two-level system. You can just avoid doing this transition and take a two-level system. And we can do with or without lasers, with a time-varying Hamiltonian, and then combine different different kind of, of experiments. So, so let me just give you uh, like an overview of this. In all these experiments, uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I will do. So let's talk about 2.2. So let's assume that we have a, our system. It can exchange work or heat with, a, with an environment. Uh, for now, we will not care about too much about the things if it's work or heat. We will just care about measuring energy variation. And so for that, we use the TPM scheme, uh, where basically, if, especially if you want to measure inflation relations, you use uh, an initial thermal state, um, which then you, is subject to some projective measurement of the Hamiltonian. Uh, then the system evolves under the map that you want to analyze, and then you measure a final you measure the energy at the, at the end, uh, and that allows you to get the energy difference. And by repeating this several times, you obtain the, the probability distribution of the energy variation. Of course, that doing this experimental is actually not so trivial for several reasons. One of the main problems is the implementation of this initial measurement, because it should be like a perfect projective measurement and non-demolition measurement. Um, and so depending on the platform, it's actually not trivial to do it. So what we have been doing actually is to avoid doing this first measurement and just prepare the state after the measurement, which is one of the Hamiltonian eigenstates. And then we just like repeat the experiment uh, 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 a number of times that is uh, representative of the initial distribution. For example, in a two-level system at the temperature, we prepare half of the time in one state and half of the time in the other state. And we uh, go on with the measurement. So then we let the system evolve under this map that can be different things. And then at the very end, we measure the probability for the system to be in one of the Hamiltonian eigenstates. Again, here in our system, we can only measure uh, SC. But we can always apply some coherent rotation to actually map this information to the observable that we want. And basically, with this, we can reconstruct the um, uh, conditional probability associated to, to energy variation and uh, asso associating with each of these experimental results the, the, the correct initial probability. We can reconstruct then the joint probability distribution and then, of course, the, the probability. Um, Okay, so this is basically kind of, okay, this is a little bit simplified, but this is more or less the, the scheme that uh, we have been using for all these uh, uh, experiments. Uh, so for example, if you use a two-level system and the Hamiltonian that it's not time varying, so that comes from Hamiltonian, uh, the, 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 the laser pulses will, will try to kick the system towards the M is equal to zero state, but the Hamiltonian between lasers will try to in, uh, Put the system to rotate in this block sphere. Um, and it turns out that even in this simple example where you have a two-level system with lasers, since the absorption of the laser has a finite probability, after some uh, laser pulses, the number of different trajectories is quite large. Um, and so um, it, it, it is still some interesting, these are still some interesting dynamics to, 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 to study. Uh, since the, the, the system still is under some sort of dissipation, it will achieve some steady state at some point. It's a steady state in the energy basis because of, of, of the system is always rotating around this Hamiltonian, but in the energy basis, it's a, it's a steady state. And then since a, it's a two-level system, we can always assume that, uh, we can always associate a cellular temperature to that uh, asymptotic state, and we can verify some like 
heat, heat exchange fluctuation in relation, uh, kind of. Uh, this is all pseudo, <laughs> obviously. Um, but yeah. Um, we can also try to do like do the same, but now in, uh, applying some time varying Hamiltonian. Obviously, the more general case is not so easy to, to, to solve, but in, in, in this particular work, we were using some Bloquet Hamiltonian where you can basically select very in a smart way the times at which you actually perform the measurements. And at that and those times, the, the work vanishes. And then we can obtain actually something very, very similar to this even when we are actually doing work on, on the system. Um, all this was about a two-level system. We can also go to a three-level system. And uh, here we have, again, the, the same kind of interaction. But it turns out that now that it's a three-level system, of course, the, the asymptotic state cannot be treated as a, as a thermal state. But also, uh, maybe we were thinking that if we take a closer look to, to how the laser uh, pulses affect the system, we can give a different interpretation. And that's actually what we found. So basically, if you remember at the, at the beginning, I told you that you have the orbital ground state, and then with the laser, it goes to some other orbital states that are short um, So, But basically, what happens is that when you absorb the laser, the first thing that happens is that you destroy all the coherences because there are some canonic decays. Uh, and then there is still some discussion about if if the system is kind of projected into each of the SC eigenstates or if it's only the, the, the coherence that happens. But in any case, after uh, the absorption, the system has some probability to decay towards the MLC. So you can model that in the reduced three level system as some with some Vladian master equation. And basically, what uh, since the laser is not always absorbed, you can model this interaction as a pure VM, okay? Where basically, if some result occurs, you will dissipate, and if some other result occurs, you will not dissipate. And this is basically a kind of a Maxwell demon, uh, where this this kind of amplitude damping is. Uh, determined by the output of, of this information. Um, and yeah, so we can, we gave this different interpretation to, to, the, to the interaction with the laser pulses for our system. And with that, we were able to, it's not trivial to actually extend the protocol to reconstruct the, the product distribution from a two-level system to a three-level system. There are many different <laughs> technical issues, but I will not go into, into details. And the point is that we were able to actually also measure this probability distribution, which allows us to reconstruct some other fluctuation relations, for example, uh, Saga Oueda Sasaki, uh, where the right hand side is now uh, the mm -hmm. efficacy of, of the feedback. And it's, uh, it's a relation because here the right hand side still depends on the trajectories, mainly uh, in the backwards trajectories. Um, but still, uh, we can. We can try to reconstruct that. And actually, we, uh, what we do is we measure the left hand side with the probability distribution, which is what I'm showing here in the points. And the right hand side, we don't measure it at every time because we can't. <laughs> <laughs> so we can simulate it. Uh, and then we can compare those two quantities of first. Um, one interesting thing is that if you, since our uh, dynamics are dissipative, uh, eventually this gamma in the steady state regime can actually be written in terms of a uh, Hilbert-Schmidt product between the initial and the asymptotic state, which, which is something that we can actually measure. And uh, yeah, that's what we did. So this green bar indicates uh, like uh, one, more point, uh, one more point with error bar that it's uh, very long times. Uh, and yeah, that will be like a real experimental verification of this only in the asymptotic regime. In the transient, we, we need to use numerics still. Since we have the probability distribution, we can also reconstruct not only the negative exponentiated work, but also some um, just the average energy variation. And here I'm showing you two different examples. Here we're changing basically the, the Hamiltonian that varies the system. Into, in one case, it is uh, uh, parallel to the dissipation 
operators, um, with this uh, deep lie and jump operators. Uh, and in some, in this other case, they are orthogonal, both orthogonal in the sense that one is Sx and the other one is Sc. And yeah, so in this case, you can see that uh, the energy, the, the system is actually losing energy due to the interaction with this demon, uh, which is what you want because then you have some extractable work um, in, uh, in or extractable energy. One. Um, and in this other case, for example, just by changing the Hamiltonian, we end up with actually the system gaining work, which some people call it like a stupid demon because it's doing the exact opposite what it was supposed to do in the original proposal. <laughs> it's dusting and it, it dusts energy. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, another interesting thing is that we can use the logarithm of gamma to, to check it as a bound of this energy variation. And it turns out that uh, if, if you compare it to, to, to some other classical bounds, it's actually a, a much tighter bound, but maybe this is not such a, such a big surprise, to be honest. But, but yeah, so this is, uh, these are basically um, uh, the results about, uh, yeah, about this TPM scheme. So now let me go quickly to this other, uh, project. This is going beyond the TPM scheme, mm -hmm. and uh, so let's let's. So I was talking before about measuring like energy at the beginning and at the end and so on. So let's take a step back and just uh, uh, let me give you a brief intro to quasi probabilities. Which I know that there are some experts in the room about this, but uh, I, 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 let me just try to to explain to you. Mm -hmm. So. Let's assume that we have two different observables at A at time zero and B at time T. And we have a system that evolves under a completely positive trade preserving map. The observable A and B can be written in the in their spectral decomposition in this way. And it turns out that if you check, like this is something that is already in an archive, there is this no-go theorem where basically assuming that, first of all, the initial state has to not commute with A initial observable, but then if also these two quantities do not commute, okay, then there is for sure no joint, joint probability distribution that has the following properties. One is to have the correct marginals, meaning that if you sum over one index, you obtain the um, probability associated at the measurement at one of those specific times, either at the beginning or at the end. Now it's the map applied to the state. And the other uh, property is the that is it should be convex linear, right? So uh, if an if a density operator is written as a linear combination of density operators, then the probability uh, distribution should also be written as a linear combination. Um, so yeah, so it turns out that there is no uh, joint probability that fulfills these two at the same time if these are not uh, incompatible observables. Um, for example, in the case of the TPM, this is the one that is not fulfilled whenever the density operator does not commute with the initial observable. There are other schemes that are involving more difficult, yeah, different protocols that actually ignore this part. They are not, not linear. Uh, but the other option is to actually use quasi probabilities where this is not a joint probability distribution, but some quasi probability distribution that can take negative values or even complex values. Um, so yes, uh, basically, quasi probabilities are uh, uh, a natural extension of correlations in, in quantum mechanics. And that's what we are trying to do here, uh, trying to measure correlation between these two, two observables. So this is the definition uh, of the keep to direct quasi probability. Um, just to compare, yeah, here is the Joint, the usual joint priority distribution, you can see that the only difference is actually the presence of this extra projector, uh, like putting the initial state in a sandwich, because this is the result of applying a projective measurement at the beginning. Um, by not putting this other projector here, the, the issue is that, I mean, this, this all works very nicely and you, it has nice marginals, so you can define very well like energy variation stuff. Uh, the problem is that measuring this stuff is not so trivial, mainly because, uh, yeah, the, the, 
this is there is actually um, this famous paper about uh, the novo theorem, uh, and they mentioned that uh, basically this this cannot be measured directly. However, they can be reconstructed with different uh, schemes, and that's what uh, I want to to tell you about today. Um, yeah, we can skip that. Um, so yeah, there are different ways to, to actually reconstruct these kind of, of quasi probabilities. One is, of course, the, the one that is called re direct reconstruction, which is used with measurements, basically means uh, putting weakly coupling your system to some pointers. Um, another, uh, this is uh, quite popular actually. Um, another possibility is to actually couple the system to an ancillary system. This starts to maybe sound familiar to what I said at the beginning. So I was getting ahead of myself, but this is actually what we are working on right now, my team, to implement some sort of, of interparametric scheme to measure it with the accuracy probabilities. Um, and yeah, and another option is to actually use something called the weak TPM scheme. And the nice thing about this is that you don't need like an extra system, like an ancillary system or a pointer. You can just uh, basically combine perturbative and non-perturbative protocols to, to extract not the full uh, Kirkwood-Dira quasi-probability, but the real part, which is also called the marginal field quasi-probability. Uh, so basically the idea is to combine these three measurements, which is the endpoint measurement, which basically just means measuring at the end of the, of the protocol, the, the usual TPM, two projective measurements, and the weak TPM, where the initial projective measurement is replaced by a non-selective measurement, meaning that the state after the measurement could be either uh, one of the Hamiltonian eigenstates or not one of the Hamiltonian eigenstates. And yeah, so if we need to, in any case, combine all these separately, uh, separated experiments from what I was showing you before, you can see that we, within the centers, we can already do like most of these experiments. Um, so yeah, so that's that's basically what uh, what we what we did. So the idea here was let's forget about all the story about like dissipation and lasers and so on. Uh, we can just take a, 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 a our system with a coherent driving that gives us a time variant Hamiltonian, uh, and we want to measure the statistics of work using this uh, this protocol. The idea would be then to. The hope is to find some negative values of the marginal field quasi probability because that is a, a proof of non classicality, and then connect that to information about the extractable work when doing the, this, this protocol. Um, okay, so I don't have too much time, maybe. Okay, yeah, okay, <laughs> then I can, I can go into details about the, the, the experiment. So, this is the kind of uh, time varying Hamiltonian that we that we were proposing to use. This is uh, uh, the Hamiltonian of, uh, of the NB already in the microwave rotating frame and after the rotating wave approximation. But basically, this is it. Uh, we select an initial pure state that obviously does not commute with the, with the initial Hamiltonian. Actually, we select a pure state that has maximum coherence because it's the one that gives us a more negative quasi probability. Uh, and then the, the idea is that we can basically use the same scheme that I was showing you before. Uh, and now it's just that we need to prepare different states uh, at the beginning. So, for example, for the endpoint measurement, where we only measure at the very end of the scheme, we really prepare the initial state that we, that we want to, to characterize, right? Instead, if we perform the TPM, we, we prepare the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And, and we combine them later um, with the correct initial probabilities, as I told you before. And similarly here, we can go for the weak TPM, we can prepare also the initial, uh, sorry, also the Hamiltonian projectors, but our eigenstates, but also these uh, other states that it turns out that since rho is a pure state, these are also pure states. And ba basically, so preparing mixed states with our platform is not so trivial, um, but preparing pure states is super easy. So that's that was kind of the idea to try to map everything to initial you know, pure states. 
Um, so yeah, we basically perform uh, these these measurements, and we can put them there together with uh, this formula that, that I showed you before. And yeah, so we saw that one of those well, one of the quasi probabilities uh, is actually negative, which was what we wanted. This is um, uh, this is actually one of the okay yeah this is this is what we wanted we can even this is already a, a proof of, of non classicality but we can make it more clear by measuring by, by putting all this together into the negativity uh, a quantity that is the sum of the absolute value of, of the first probabilities minus one obviously if this is a joint probability distribution this is zero so this is like the classical limit and then everything on beyond zero would be non classical limit. And the, the, the main message of, of, this, of this work, <laughs> of this project, is the work. Uh, so we, these are, since we measure the, the quasi probabilities and also the TPM during the process, we can reconstruct the associated mean energy variation. In this case, it's a closed system, so the mean work. And you can see that, first of all, the peaks on work coincide with the peaks of non-classicality, which is something interesting. The, 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 the extracted work, here there is a negative sign, the extracted work is actually enhanced by using the, the by non-performing this initial projective measurement. Um, and maybe even more interesting is that we found that this uh, extractable work has some bound, basically this, this bound right here, which is this dashed line, which is fulfilled whenever a stochastic classical st stochastic interpretation of your experiment can be done. Basically, this is fulfilled when, when the negativity is equal to zero. And yeah, so we found this bound and our experiments go beyond that bound. So this is another witness of non-classicality. But the interesting thing is that this involves TPM probabilities and the, this final measurement probability, the bound. And the work here, although we can write it in terms of quasi probabilities, since these have the correct marginals, you can also write them in terms of the final probability. Uh, so, yeah, the mean final energy minus the mean initial energy. And so, basically, this could be like a way to witness non classicality without going. To, to to reconstruct all the quasi probabilities just by combining these two two different schemes. Still, you require two of these, but not three, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's basically everything that I wanted to present. Uh, so I, again, the the I guess the take home message is that NV centers are a nice platform to work with in, in quantum thermodynamics. They have some. Uh, Reach so it's not only about the high degree of control of the system, but also uh, its environment that can be several different things that we can even use it to our advantage. Um, and yeah, so this is something that I already mentioned before, but right now we are actually working on on doing a very similar work extraction protocol, but with uh, with a different uh, scheme. This is an interparametric scheme. Um, and this is just because then we can access not only the real part of the quasi probabilities, but also the, the imaginary part. Uh, actually, what we reconstruct is the characteristic function of the quasi probability distribution, but still uh, we have access to, to, to all this. Um, so, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, I think that, thank you, first of all, for your talk. Uh, I just have a few questions. The first one is more on really quantum foundation. So this is really good test bed for the emergence of classicality. This is a like a naturally occurring phenomena with good coherence time. And there was actually an experiment where they probe the emergence of classicality in the systems where you measure the nitrogen vacancy <laughs> centers and you measure the spin inside. And I'm just curious whether there are experimental techniques where you can do local measurements on the carbon atoms that are interacting with the system or the, 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 the central spin in order to probe the information that they carry about the central spin, which is one of the key features to understanding the emergence of this. Um, 
So actually, so measuring the nucleus things around the NB is actually not something that we can do. What people do is actually use the NB as a probe, and then if you want to take your system to be this 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 set of nucleus things, you use the NB as a probe to actually measure them. Because the problem is that these are not optically active, so we don't have access to, to those. We can drive them if you characterize well its properties, the nuclear spin properties. We can drive them with uh, radio frequencies, but we cannot measure them. Well, yeah. And you cannot couple, uh, you can couple a bunch of them, right? Yeah. And you can take and look at it. Yeah, I was just thinking about it in terms of environment because no experiment was done that is convincing enough for now. That would tell us the amount of information, the environment, fragments of the environment, right. the right. system, which is the important part. Yeah. And uh, just one final question. So, uh, you said there is some kind of non classicality in these quasi probabilities, and I'm not sure what type of non classicality is captured. So, are we talking about entanglement or more general things like quantum discord? So, what is, or to put it in other words, so can you define a consistent information theory? Quantity from these quasi probabilities, even though they don't follow the normal probe axiom. So, is there a way to do that? No, probably I'm not the best person in this room to answer this, this, this question, but I can give you like my interpretation. So, this is not a, a really about entanglement or something like that. It's more like about being able to reconstruct this kind of dynamics using some stochastic, classic stochastic. Oh, so that's more than classical. It's interesting because here we have a three level system with some coherent driving, which is actually not something so complicated. You would think that maybe that could be done with some, like, you know, classic probability distribution movement of, uh, of populations or something. But it turns out that even in these simple experiments, there are some cases where a classical interpretation is actually. Not, not possible. So I want to ask about the uh, um, the interpretation uh, of uh, the Maxwell demon. So, uh, if I've understood correctly, the idea is that uh, depending upon the outcome of of a measurement, uh, then you either optically pump or you don't optically pump. Is that the idea? It's <laughs> it's more, uh, I mean, I mean that's, more, that's more or less the idea. The thing is that it's not something that we do. So the, the, the pump, so the laser has kind of two different uh, one is, of course, first projecting and so on, so on that, and then dissipating. So it's kind of, that's why we call it like an autonomous thing, because. Right, well, that was exactly my, my issue. It's not sort of the, the textbook. Uh, 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 Maxwell Demon, where you interpret uh, the, uh, 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 the the problem with entropy by imagining the entropy of whatever calculating process the demon has to do here, uh, you don't have that. It happens on its own. Yes. Uh, but but it happens because of of the natural dissipation that results from uh, uh, following the laser excitation. Yes. So exactly. I'm a little bit uncomfortable because it sounds like. Um, this would mean that any optical pumping process could be interpreted as being a Maxwell demon. Is that what you want? Uh, I, I, it's, that's not what we want, but that's I, I, when I was when I, when I was so this is actually something that I was like proposing to the group. And my idea is that you can in some way say that any interaction with uh, some field, since the probability to absorb the field is not equal to one unless you have very high fields or something. You can always think of this as some sort of conditional cases, right? If you absorb, you perturbate the system. If you don't absorb, the system remains in the original state. So if you want to call that feedback, which is what we do, it's fine. And you can call that an autonomous demon. Uh, and that's kind of our claim. But I understand that it's not really a demon where you have also to take into consideration like feedback and even errors in the feedback or on the readout. But yeah, that's more or less what was our claim. Do you think it represents a different class of demon or? Um... <laughs> I guess, it's, uh, yeah, I guess, I don't know.
I found it interesting, but I think it could be maybe less interesting. It, it depends. On but but presumably the entropy now goes into spontaneous emission. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's how you would count for the entropy. Yes. Uh, uh, a question about you, you had mentioned quasi probabilities, um, and and you said that they, these could be used to, as a kind of I think you call it a witness for non non classicality. In in your view, is that the main motivation for using probabilities to show non classicality, or or, or are there other physical motivations? Well, and maybe the uh, second question: you mentioned a couple different kinds of quasi probabilities. What um, what kind of physical mo motivations do you have, or motivations of any sort to to use one as opposed to prefer one? Kind of quasi probability to another. Yes. Okay. So let me go back. Yeah. So, um, but I guess one thing is like witnessing non classicality is, of course, something interesting because we want to be sure that we are doing processes that are not, that are beyond classical. But uh, another like important aspect is that. We want to be able to reconstruct energy variation statistics, taking into consideration the coherence or entanglement or anything outside the diagonal elements of the integrator of, of the initial state. So that was actually our original mm. goal to, to try to go beyond, like that, try to take into consideration yeah. the, the coherence of, of the initial state. Um, and about the second question, so when you say different quasi probabilities, you mean like Margin Kirkwood Dirac, the uh, more, yeah, the Margin Hill, yeah. Hill, Margin Hill, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so Margin Hill is just the real part of the Kirkwood Dirac, so they are basically the same. If you, if you, if you, if you, so. It's just that we, in this experimental platform, we didn't have access to the imaginary part, so we, we use the, the Margin Hill, but it, it's actually interesting to also see. What happens to, to the media. Um, the, the main difference, like with other, like with like Wigner functions or something, mm -hmm. is that here we can actually see not to, uh, instead of seeing like not, uh, incompatible observables at the very uh, at, the, at the same time, we can see like incompatible observables that are separated by some dynamics in the middle. So we are here we are kind of not only talking about the quantumness of the initial state, but also the quantumness of the process between these two. That's kind of the main difference between like, uh, yeah, this and you know, something like a video. Thanks. Yeah, to follow up on that, um, I was interested in the, the peaking of the quasi probabilities negativity yes. and the, the work. Um, and I guess, yeah, that seems like something kind of intuitively nice or what you'd want to see, but do you have any intuition about why those actually? Like an in, intuitive explanation for why those coincide. So wait, are you saying what? Well, like an intuitive you had a plot with. Uh, so why this peak goes higher when using quasi probabilities, or what, what was your question? I, I thought at some point you made a statement about, um, uh, yeah, the the negativity allowing the work peak to go higher. Yeah. Like yeah why yeah. why should this yeah. non classicality allow? Uh, more work to be extracted. So one 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 thing that is important is that um, this 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 is the quasi probability that we measure to be negative, mm -hmm. and we kind of design the experiment in a very specific way because we want that this this quasi probability to be associated to the highest energy uh, like the transition. This this represents the transition from which the energy uh, sorry from which the, the system will actually. Uh, wind energy. It, 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 it goes from the ground state to the third state, right? Uh, so in general, this transition would represent injecting energy to the system. But since the quasi probability is uh, since this quasi probability is negative, then when you put it in that expression, it changes the sign, and then that thing that was actually putting this curve towards a lower value, it goes higher. Um, uh, that's the mathematical interpretation. So the physical interpretation, the only thing that I can say is that I guess that it's not only about like the initial state coherence, but again also about the possibility to measure uh, all, all, all the process that, that is involved in, in the work extraction project. 
sorry, maybe it's not the no, no, that, that was, answer, but yeah, that's at least right. mathematically you could have an insight of why it's like this. But I, I know we're out of time. This is actually not 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 a question from me, but from from the chat room. Uh, is is it is our NV centers a suitable experimental platform to study thermal thermal electric properties of materials like topological insulators and graphene? Um, so I'm 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 not sure. I'm I'm not so familiarized with, with uh, this concept. I I haven't heard of this so. I, I don't sorry. I don't want to say it. I I um I had a curiosity. Do you know what let's say what uh, happens to the for example to the higher statistical moments of the world distribution and one uses like sort of number of the variance of the world distribution? Yeah. That's actually yeah, that's actually something very interesting that we are planning to study in this other project. Uh, but yeah, that's actually, yeah, it seems really basically that across the full probability distribution, we can have access to higher momentum variation. And we can, so I can tell you now that these also uh, go beyond some classical boundary principle. We, we can see some improvement in those on those plans. Do you expect like a larger variance? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because of the first yeah. measurement that you found. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it's ten forty five. So uh, let's uh, thank thank the presenter again. Come back to here as